So it was a full family ministry together, and we appreciate that. I invite you to take your Bibles and go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 20 as we continue our series on the history of kings, tragedy, and triumph. This is a sermon on tragedy. And Lord willing, you will have great triumph by the time that we're done. 2 Samuel chapter 20. Second Samuel 20, we're going to begin reading in verse number 4. And the king said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me within three days, and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, now Sheba, the son of Betri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape. So Joab's men with the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of of Beatry. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the message this morning. Father, we are thankful we can come together. It's always a blessing to look out and to see the families of this church assemble for worship and the love and specialties that we put in this place. Thank you for New England Shores and thank you for the spirit of care that you've put here. Our hearts are missing, though, those who are not able to be here due to flu and other circumstances and sicknesses. Lord, our prayers are with them, asking that you would help them to recover quickly, and uh, we pray for the sick, that you would heal them. Well, Lord, as we all gather together online and in person, that we would be sensitive to the teachings found in God's Word. Lord, we ask for the Holy Spirit to have dominion in this hour as he opens the scriptures to us and shows us what we need to learn from the word of God and help us to be doers of the word. Father, I agree with John the Baptist when he said, I must decrease and Christ must increase. Hide this foolish preacher behind the cross of Christ, that Christ alone might be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Unbeknownst to some, 911 is an emergency service and not for personal annoyances. Latresa Goodman called 911 three times to report her local McDonald's in Fort Pierce, Florida ran out of chicken nuggets. Goodman claimed that it was certainly an emergency and they tried, they tried to offer me a double cheeseburger instead and she didn't want one. Bevalente Hall called 911 because Subway, get this, Subway used marinara sauce on her pizza instead of the pizza sauce in North Carolina. Well, what she didn't know is that Subway only has marinara sauce and they also double it for a pizza sauce. So she demanded that the police take a report so she could get on the news and get a free pizza. Instead, she spent the night in jail and was released on $2,000 bond for a false 911 call. In Port Oregon, a man broke into someone's home to take a shower, or at least that's what he was doing when the people came home. They found him in the bathroom, singing away, cleaning himself, and not only did the homeowner call 911, but so did the intruder because he was afraid that the homeowner might have a gun. <laughs> Do stories like this just utterly baffle you? How could a person be so absolutely self-indulgent? Well, in 2 Samuel 20, 
we examined how David had times in his life that he was self-indulgent. But his consequences began to pile up. He almost lost his kingdom for a second time in this chapter. But one reason that we adore David is because he learned from his failures. This morning we're going to contrast what we've learned about David. How he was a flawed man that made mistakes but learned how to correct them. To Joab who was a flawed man that did not correct his mistakes. Quite a few commentaries and devotionals online point out Joab's positive qualities like bravery, boldness, and loyalty. But they miss the flaws in his character. Because you can be brave and bold and loyal and still be unruly, short-tempered, and treasonous. So this morning I want to look at Joab's biography, if you will, and give you a stark warning. And that warning has already been given to you in the message about David. It is the same proposition. Self-indulgence produces solemn consequences. Self-indulgence produces solemn consequences. So while David teaches us how to overcome our self-indulgence, Joab shows us how we can destroy ourselves. And it leaves you with a decision. Do I want to be like David or do I want to be like Joab? Because the two men's reaction are very different. And I want to encourage you this morning to be like David and not Joab. We're going to see three things this morning. Joab was impulsive. Joab was infectious. And Joab was insensitive. So number one. A self-indulgent person is impulsive. A self-indulgent person is impulsive. We left off reading in verse 7, so let's go down to verse 8. So when they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath and his hip. And as he was going forward, it fell out. Now, I think the concept is that Joab sneaked his sword out of his sheath in a way that Amasa could not see it. Then Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? <laughs> not for long, buddy. And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. And Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with it in the stomach, and his entrails pulled out, poured out on the ground, and he did not strike him again. And thus Amasa died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Betri. You know, Joab is the type of person who acts without thought, or care of consequences. He is the type that throws caution to the wind, and coincidentally, he acts on his emotions alone, without taking thought of what he should do. In the heat of the moment, he doesn't think slowly through his choices. But understand, that for all of us, there is an expectation that God has on us, whether it's Old Testament or New. Let me show you. Go to Proverbs 14. We'll come back to 2 Samuel 20 in a moment. Proverbs 14, verse 16. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 16. A wise man fears and departs from evil. For what you know about Joab, is he a wise man? <laughs> but a fool rages in self-confidence. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly. And a man of wicked intentions is hated. Now, go down to verse 29. 
He who is slow to wrath has great understanding. But he who is what? Impulsive exalts folly. The King James uses the word hasty instead of indulgence. The New King James says is, uh, instead of impulsive. New King James says impulsive. King James says hasty. The Hebrew word is actually a compound word combining two thoughts. Number one, short. That means impatient. And the second word is temper. You put them together, you come up with what? Short-tempered. Someone who doesn't slow down, consider the consequences, but just acts out of the heat of the moment. Someone who is impulsive or hasty. And what does God say about such a man? He says that he is foolish. Foolish. What is God's standard? God's standard is self-control. And it doesn't matter if it's in Proverbs, written at the time of King Solomon, after Joab. Because David is able to act with self-control. And so are godly men before him, but not Joab. And it doesn't matter if it's all the way to the New Testament, it's still God's standard. For you and for me, it's a little bit different because a fruit of the Spirit is what? Self-control or temperance. But it's always the same. That is what God expects. God expects you not to be impulsive, but to be godly in your decision making. You know what Joab was? Impulsive. But you have to understand the context of Joab's life. It's not just 2 Samuel 20. Who is Joab? Well, Joab is the brother of Abishai and Asahel. Their mother, Zeruiah. Well, who's that? It's the sister of David. So these are the nephews of King David. And all three brothers are loyal to their king, particularly when Saul plotted to kill David. These three men were very loyal, although I would say they are probably not the brightest of individuals at times. Saul's general, Abner, killed Asahel for foolish actions. And Joab and Abishai sought revenge against Abner but weren't able to achieve it. After Saul died, if you remember, David could not ascend to the throne of Israel. And it was because that same Abner gave support of his army to who? Ishbosheth, who technically is the second king over Israel. And so that war between Judah and David and Ishbosheth and Israel lasted seven and a half years during which time Joab proved his loyalty over and over again to King David. In particularly, Joab led a party of commandos to go and capture Jerusalem. One fascinating study I mark for the future is in verse 7 when we start studying the Cherethites, the Pelthites, and all the mighty men. These are hired hitmen and assassins. That would be an interesting Bible study someday for you menly men. But Joab proves his worth. He captures Jerusalem. And David rewarded Joab with an appointment to be the commander of the army. As the war came to a close, Abner realized that he would not be able to defeat David. And so there was a peace treaty struck between the two men in which David did not want Abner killed. But Joab never forgot that Abner killed his brother Asahel. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 27 states that Joab killed Abner. Why? To avenge the blood of his brother. Even though King David struck a peace treaty with Abner. Why? Because Joab is impulsive. He doesn't have a respect to authority. Joab does what Joab wants to do. A second incident in Joab's life is, as we've seen a little bit in more detail, is when 
David gave the order not to kill Absalom. And Joab never had an intention, I believe, to actually follow that order. He acted impulsively when he discovered that Absalom was hanging in a tree and had his men kill him after he plunged Absalom through with a spear. As punishment, what did David do? Joab was demoted, and Amasa, another of David's nephews, was appointed the new commander of the army. You know, it's rather curious how Amasa was appointed to the army as a commander because he was actually a follower of Absalom in that one-year war between Absalom and David. It's probably not the brightest thing David could have done is to take an enemy and make him commander over the army, but it was his nephew, and Joab, I believe, totally disagreed with it. Of course, he's bitter and angry because he lost his command for his treasonous acts by killing Absalom. So then now this third incident, in 2 Samuel 20, Joab makes it a point to correct his king's decision by relying on his own wisdom. David instructed, as we've read, Amasa to assemble the army within three days because he knew that the Sheba rebellion could be worse than the Absalom rebellion. When Amasa failed to meet the deadline, King David gave the order in verse 6, and David said to who? What does verse 6 say, folks? Abishai. Now Sheba, the son of Betri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find him fortified, uh, find himself fortified in cities and escape us. And so, verse 7, who? Abishai's men, right? Uh, no. Who? Joab. But who's given the command? Abishai. Find that rather interesting. So when Amasa fails to meet the deadline, Joab takes matters into his own hands. Most commentators agree that probably Amasa is delaying because he is not loyal to David. Go figure, he served Absalom. And so Joab catches up with Amasa. He greets him in the cultural greeting of the day. So it's not strange to read that he grabbed him by the beard, okay? Um, it's a cultural thing. Please, please, that, that's not our culture. I keep mine short anyway, but please don't touch my beard. Okay? And as this is happening, Joab distracts Amasa. Hey, how you doing? You feeling healthy? Everything go? Hey, let me kiss you as our greeting. Grab your beard. And whoop, there it goes. He does one strike and he fillets Amasa. He plunges his sword and he rips it sideways and he disembowels his cousin. Amasa is left in the road, wallowing in a pool of blood. Can we at least say this? Joab is a very consistent man. With violence and with disregard from authority, even though he was typically loyal to David. I wonder if Joab's motto was, just follow your heart. Because that's what he was doing. You know, such a motto would give you the idea that your heart knows. It's okay, just trust your heart. Well, I think Joab proves that the problem is the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So Joab, this hitman of the Old Testament, is selfish, unbridled, unruly, and absolutely impulsive. Now, I hope... I really hope that you are thinking, but pastor, I haven't killed anybody lately. Whew, thank you. I don't want to deal with that this week, please. But I'm illustrating a point about behavior. Joab consistently demonstrates a lack of respect to authority, violent intentions, and absolutely no care for others because he cares about himself. The same may be true about you. Are you impulsive? 
Let me illustrate it this way. Many years ago, when I arrived to the hospital to have my colon removed, an unsaved lady from our community that recognized me, just a, a dear lady that I know, caught me going into the hospital with Andy. This woman had no idea that I was going in for surgery on that day. Although if she had taken a moment to look, she probably could have guessed that I wasn't in good shape. I had a ruptured colon. She was at the hospital visiting a friend, and immediately she cast her burden on me to see if I could go visit her friend. I announced to her that's probably not likely because I'm going in to have a colon removed. I have no long idea how long it's going to be or how long I'll be in the hospital. And then this horrific look came over this woman's face. She was one of the sweetest, kindest ladies that I know. And she apologized profusely for not pausing to see the condition that I was in. And we had a good laugh and no harm is done. Have you ever been so impulsive because you are self-consumed in the heat of the moment that you can't see anything beyond the tip of your nose? If you say I've never been there, probably should meet for prayer and repentance for lying because all of us have been there. But the question is, do you live there? Do you live there? Are you a person that's so focused on your needs and yourself that you can't see anyone else's needs, cares, difficulties, or trials, and you come to them and you roll them over like a steamroller because it's all about you and your cares? You ever been there? Do you live there? Some people come to church ready to blast all their burdens on their pastor and church family and never once consider that the church family and the pastors have their own cares and burdens. Now, let me say this. Galatians 6.2 is wonderful. Bear ye one another's burdens, right? But it doesn't say, here you go, just take all mine, but I don't want yours. It doesn't say dumping all your burdens on your friends for they care for you. It's not it. God has given us a very special place that we can come together and not just put our burdens out there to help each other bear them. We can now bring them side by side together and together we can cast all our cares upon him for he cares for us. It works both ways. No, I'm not telling you, I'm not rebuking you, saying, don't bring your burdens to the church. Well, this is the place that you should bring them. But just understand that the people that are beyond the tip of your nose have their own burdens and trials and pains and difficulties, and it is your duty as a believer not to be impulsive and steamroll them with yours because it's bearing one another's burdens, not everybody bearing yours. Philippians 2.4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on what? The things of others. That's not Joab. Joab is self-indulgent. Now you may not be a murderer like Joab, praise the Lord, but don't be so self-indulgent that you run over people in order to get what you want because it makes you feel better. That's being impulsive, and that is a Joab. Self-indulgence produces solemn consequences. You will hurt those around you if you are that way. So a self-indulgent person, number one, is impulsive. Second, a self-indulgent person is infectious. Look at me with, to verse 11. Look with me to verse 11. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. 
And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him. When he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. And when he was removed from the highway, all the people went after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Betri. You know, the problem with a self-indulgent person is that they require an audience to boost their ego. Joab's behavior was so outrageous that he became a leader of men who admired such behavior. There is a selfish grab for power in what we just read. So think about it. With Amasa's body lying in the road, the men under his command really don't know what to do. Their commander was just killed by his cousin. One of Joab's men made the announcement, whoever favors Joab, whoever is in favor of David, let's go after Joab. But wait a moment. Who commissioned Joab to be the man to stand up for David? You know the answer? Joab did. Because as we just saw in verse 6, who did David commission to be the leader against Sheba? Abishai, Joab's brother. Where was Abishai when all this took place? I don't know the answer to that. Where is Abishai in the rest of the chapter? I don't really know that either. Joab takes command. And by murdering Amasa, Joab demonstrated who is actually fully in charge. Joab got what Joab wanted. And although David appointed Abishai the leader, <laughs> Joab always finds a way to get what Joab wants. You know, we kind of come across many Joabs in this life. Such individuals seem well-intended and loyal to a degree. Oh, but the moment that something or someone gets in their way, they will dump you like a bad habit. As a pastor, I think I've probably met this person many times in the last 13 years. They love NESBC as long as the church and the pastor make them happy and do what they want. And the moment... There is a disagreement. Look out, it's firework time. That person seems loyal at first. But the moment you cross them, they turn into a Joab rather than seeking peace and honoring the Lord. It's not just that Joab has a power grab. But Joab also has a betrayal. Keep your finger in 2 Samuel 20. Go to 1 Kings 1. First Kings chapter 1, verse 5. And Adonijah, the son of Haggath, that's a wife of David, exalted himself and said, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father, that's David had not rebuked him at any time by saying, why have you done so? He was very good looking. His mother had borne him after Absalom. Then Adonijah, he confront, conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and Abathar, the priest. And they followed and helped Adonijah. Well, that's interesting. David is nearing the end of his life. David, by this point, has already conferred and made Solomon the heir to the throne. But Adonijah, one of David's other sons, wanted to be king, and so he assembles his military force, and he makes a commander of that military force, and what is that commander's name? 
Joab. Joab gave his loyalty to Adonijah rather than Solomon. Look down to verse 30. David says to Bathsheba, Just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon your son shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. So certainly, I will do it this day. Once again, Joab demonstrates no respect for authority. And I think Joab is the supreme opportunist, and he would jump at anything that would give him the power that he sought. Again, a lot of those commentators and devotional writers say, well, at least Joab was loyal. Really? He wasn't loyal in the first chapter of Kings. Ever heard the name Herm Edwards? He was an American football coach, former NFL player who played nine seasons with the Philadelphia Eagles. He coached the New York Jets. That's hard for me to say from this pulpit because I don't like that word very much. For five seasons. Kansas City Chiefs for three. That's a little bit more respectable. He's been coaching the Arizona State Sun Devils since 2017. Edwards was known for some really great one-liners. I say this to my son all the time. You play to win the game, right? But there's another quote from Herm Edwards that I want to give you, and I really like this one. The players that play on this football team will play for the name on the side of the helmet and not the name on the back of their jersey. I like that. Honestly, that's why he was a really bad NFL football coach. Because the guys on his team were there to play for what? Themselves, their paydays, the names on the back of their jerseys. He's a much better college football coach. But you know, I think some Christians really have a problem acting like they play for the name on the back of their jersey. So we are supposed to live the Christian life in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we have been bought with a price and we're not supposed to try to build our own kingdoms. But some Christians will only serve the Lord if they get the choice of what they want to do and if somehow it benefits them and the name on the back of their jersey. Yet Christ gave himself as a sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. And the least that a Christian can do is to live for the one who purchased salvation with his blood. Colossians 1.18, Christ is the head of the body, the church. And as Christians, we are to be consumed with Jesus Christ and not ourselves. So let's make this very practical. Do you live for yourself like a Joab? Or do you live for Christ? Here's a few questions. Do you ignore your responsibility to give to God financially? If you're a church member, you've committed to doing so. If the church has a budget shortfall, is it because you have not obeyed God in your requirements to give to him first? You realize that your checkbook is one of the first things that shows where your loyalty lies? It's true. Do you think you're in control of the ministries in your local church that so people have to meet your standards and your requirements? How about when you come to church? Do you just look for ways to serve the Lord? Or do you look for ways to control people to do things your way? What do you do to serve the Lord at NESBC? When you walk in the door, are you a spectator who watches other members work and prepare for services while you comfortably sit and enjoy your coffee and your snacks? Praise the Lord for coffee and snacks. However, 
You need to serve the Lord and be a healthy part of the body and not be a spectator of all the people that are ministering, working all around you. Who is the most selfish person you know? Who is the most selfish person you know? If you're thinking about anybody else right now, stop it. Start focusing on your own need in sanctification and Christ-likeness. You are the most selfish person you know. And when you finally learn how to fix that, then you can lovingly disciple others rather than criticize them. That's Christ-likeness. But Joab doesn't have those traits. He's self-indulgent. He's impulsive. And he's infectious to the people around him. Self-indulgence produces solemn consequences. Your self-indulgence can cause serious pain to your family, your church, and your neighbors. Don't be a Joab. Finally this morning, a self-indulgent person is insensitive. Look at back to 2 Samuel 20, verse 14. Second Samuel 20, verse 14. And when he went through all the tribes of Israel and Abel and Beth Maka and all the Barites, so they were gathered together and went also after Sheba. And they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maka. And they cast up a siege mound against the city. And it stood by rampart. And all the people who were Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman cried out from the city, Here, here, please say to Joab, Come nearby that I may speak with you. And when he had come near to her, the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. And then she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, Okay, I'm listening. So she spoke, saying, They used to talk in former times, saying, They surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would end disputes. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. And you seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, Oh, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Betri by name, has raised his hand against the king against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. I like this lady. Then the woman, in her wisdom, went to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Betri, and threw out to Joab, it blew a trumpet and withdrew from the city, every man to his own tent. So Joab returned to the king in Jerusalem. So in Joab's fury, he mounts a charge against Sheba. A, the city of Abel is about 90 miles away from he, where he murdered Amasa. Joab is ready to level the city. Back in these times, city had walls. Joab isn't the most sensitive of individuals. He was a warrior. He had a one-track mind. Kill or be killed. He didn't pause to consider the consequences of his behavior. And so he proceeded to build a siege ramp so that he and his army could get up to the walls of the city over or knock them down. It would be easier for his forces to get into Sheba. But that type of military action is also preventative from supplies like food and water being brought in and out of the city. And so the residents of the city are now suffering as Joab and the army are building this siege wall to get over the wall. 
And then there's the fact that once the siege wall is built, anyone in that city that's still alive is going to be massacred by the army rushing in, and then they will check for dead bodies and the identity of Sheba at a different time. You know, you know what's missing from this text of Scripture? And it's so simple. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, city of Abel, is Sheba in there? Could we please have him? You don't find that in the Scriptures. Wouldn't that have been the easy solution? Instead of preparing to ransack the city? It seems like a simple thing to do is simply ask the godly people in this city, we need justice, the king has an order, could you please give a Sheba? But that's not done. Rather, the self-indulgent, self-consumed, impulsive, infectious, insensitive Joab doesn't stop to think about the consequences to his actions. It's his way or the highway, and so he's ready to steamroll anybody in that city so he can get what he wants. And he doesn't care who it hurts. Do Christians do similar things? At times they do. They think their sign of the coin is the right uh, side and the consideration is that I will get my side of the coin no matter what it costs and no matter how it hurts others. Maybe they even have the right opinion. Was Joab wrong for seeking Sheba? Not at all. But the death toll that was about to happen because the way that he was going to do it was absolutely wrong. Maybe it's comparable to you speaking the truth, but not doing it in love. Joab was insensitive. He was unloving. And he was ungracious. And the superstar of this passage is this woman with a beautiful plea. A sensible, peaceful, faithful woman. We don't even know her name. She requests an audience with Joab. And the way that she approaches him is with absolute grace and absolute dignity. She doesn't chastise him. She calls herself the maidservant. She asks so nicely and kindly, could I please speak with Joab? She explains how Abel is a place that has always been a place of peaceful solutions. And how destroying a whole city just to get one man is ruthless, unreasonable, and unfair. And she points this out. We're on the same side here. Well, Joab and this woman strike a peace accord. If she can produce Sheba, Joab will stop his steamrolling ideas and he will leave. And so it happens. Sheba has a neck ache and his head comes over the wall. This is a wise woman. But this woman's actions, because she was not self-indulgent, did she have something in the game? Oh, yes. She would have died. But she goes to her city elders and she pleads the case, let's do this. And this is a woman that God used to save this city and the people of it. Joab lived for the name on the back of his jersey. This woman lived for the name on the side of her helmet. Let me close this morning by asking you, you know how Joab died? We won't go to the passage, but as David was on his deathbed, he actually instructed Solomon to execute Joab because of his traitorous ways. Enough was enough. So Solomon orders Joab's death, and so hearing this, Joab fled to the tabernacle as if it were this great, wonderful place of safety as he was having this religious conversion to a faith that he never followed. Maybe that would save him. Maybe the tabernacle would be a good luck charm for him. Surely no one would slaughter a man there. He didn't go for repentance. He didn't go for worship. Benaiah caught him 
and slaughtered him at the tabernacle, Solomon's general and now new leader of the army. But do you know what is absolutely ironic? Do you know what Joab's name means? Yahweh is my father. Do you think Joab lived up to his name? What is your name? Christian. Christ follower. Little Christ. Do you live up to your name? Or are you a self-indulgent wrecking ball who destroys everyone in your path to get what you want because you're so focused on yourself you don't even realize it's what you're doing? If I've described you, if the Holy Spirit this morning from this text is saying, don't be like Joab. Come to the Lord. Repent and forsake the sin of self-indulgence. D.L. Moody said this, God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. Self-indulgence produces solemn consequences. Father, we thank you that the scriptures record this life not very well lived that serve as a warning We've seen two men in this chapter that are the antithesis of each other. One indulges in himself, looks at the consequences adding up, repents and gets his life right, and now sets out to overcome his failures. And the other plunges through life, not seeing anybody beyond the tip of his nose, not caring about others, not being gracious, He's self-indulgent. He's impulsive. He's infectious. And ultimately, he's very insensitive. Lord, would you work in the hearts of your church here this morning and online to help people not be a Joab? for the consequences are not worth it. He will ultimately lose his life because of his selfishness. And even if he thought he was loyal to King David, he did stab David in the back at the end. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand for an invitation this morning. Are you a self-indulgent person? We all are to some degree. Would you be sensitive before the Lord and search your heart this morning? Are you impulsive? Do you infect others with your rebellion? And are you insensitive to others with no grace or dignity, love or kindness? Don't be a Joab. Father, you know hearts as they come before you in this moment. I pray that this would be a glorious day at any SBC where we all would deal with our sins appropriately. Learn from the example of David that when we fall, we can get back up and do the right things. I pray that the spirit of David would be in this place and not the spirit of Joab. Help us to appreciate and value what you have done in NESBC. And help us to fight tooth and nail to keep Joab away. Whether it be in ourselves, whether it be in someone trying to be a wolf among the sheep. May we all be sensitive and self-reflective to guard against Joab. In Jesus' name we pray.